I'd rather die while I'm living than live while I'm dead. This is a unique episode. A little while ago, a good friend of mine, Rob Angel, shout out Rob, called me one night and said I had to interview this guy, Norman Kent. So I looked Norman up. He's a skydiving pioneer with more than 30,000 jumps to his name, including records and groundbreaking experiences like the first expedition to ever jump onto the North Pole. So I called Norman and said, mate, given your background, we need to make this the best intro to a podcast that's ever been done. He agreed, so check out the video version of this episode and you'll see the successful world record attempt that this intro is part of. Okay, here we go. We're at 18,000 feet. I am Norman Kent and this is Win the Day with James Whitaker. Here we go. Listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California. Here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Hey, winners, welcome back to Win the Day. If this is your first time here, we sit down with some of the world's true change makers to give you all the tips, tools, and strategies to win the day every day. The quote for this episode comes from Edward Steiglitz and says, In the end, it's not the years in your life that count, it's the life in your years. Norman Kent has forged a reputation for walking the road less traveled. Throughout his extraordinary life, two passions, his search for adventure and love of photography, have been his constant companions. Norman embarked on his first jungle expedition at 14 years old, where he developed a strong desire to capture the beauty he saw and share it with the world. At 19 years old, Norman made his first skydive a moment that would change his life forever. Since that time, Norman has worked on blockbuster films like Cliffhanger, Kingsman and Godzilla. He's also made his own skydiving films, consulted the special forces units and helped facilitate record-breaking feats all over the world, as well as jumping into the ceremonies of both the Summer and Winter Olympic Games. As I mentioned earlier, Norman has more than 30,000 jumps to his name, including world firsts like the first expedition to ever jump onto the North Pole, a joint exercise with the US and Russian militaries, which seems pretty funny to say these days, given what's transpired in the world. In the skydiving community, Norman has earned the respect as the world's best skydiving cinematographer. In this episode, we're going to talk about what drives Norman's continued love of adventure, how to summon courage during your most fearful moments, some of the most fascinating moments from his acclaimed career, and what Norman's time at the coalface of death has taught him about life. Before we begin, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, Share it with them right now. All right, let's win the day with the man, the legend, Norman Kent. Norman, great to see you, my friend. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to have an opportunity to chat about the things that are interesting. I guess we need to start by talking about the intro of the episode. Walk us, walk us through what happened there in the world record attempt that you, that you filmed. Yes. Um, well, you asked me to do something interesting for the intro, and I thought, well, yeah, I'm, I'm actually uh, doing this world record attempt, world record jumps, and which was uh, skydivers over 60, trying to build a formation over 100 skydivers. And I thought, if I can just talk them into not listening to what I'm saying and not getting confused about, uh, you know, thinking that I'm saying, let's go, you know, because we're listening, we're, at that point, we're listening to the commands of going. And if I can get my mind to say these things and, and say the intro without really uh, getting too distracted, because I was also waiting for the command to go, and it could have happened in the middle of me saying the <laughs> sentence. <laughs> so, uh, and at the same time, I'm doing a selfie with a with a GoPro, which I rarely do. Uh, I'm getting more into it now. So I thought, uh, let's try it, and and uh, it just was kind of an overwhelming thing trying to handle all those things. But it was awesome, and I really thought the. The the intro was uh, very. I thought I I really got a had a good time doing it, 
And luckily, also the event yielded a, a world record. And there's going to be a, a documentary. I'm actually featured in the documentary. I'm one of the people featured because I am over 60. And uh, it's, a, it's a documentary that's going to be in, in PBS. And it's, a, it's Skydivers Over 60, a world record. It's, I believe that's the working title and or it's going to be the end title that's what uh, what i was told it, so cool. it'll be released at the uh, uh, may of 2024 yeah you nailed it and i guess it's hard to do a second take when you're up there skydiving yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes it is it is hard it's also kind of hard because i have a uh, um i have a reputation of injuring myself when i'm <laughs> When I'm on camera, you know, <laughs> I sort of start thinking too much about the camera and then realize that, uh, you know, I get distracted. So it was really great fun to not get injured and do, <laughs> I can do my job and do a good job. And at the same time, be wondering what the camera, if the camera in my hand was pointing in the right direction and all these other things, you know. Well, speaking about cameras, you have this helmet in front of us. And I know you've got quite a, a amazing relationship with this helmet. So can you describe what we're looking at here, how it's changed your life? And uh, also we've got people listening on the podcast as well. Uh, on audio, yes. sorry. Yes. Uh, well, the helmet is, um, it, you know, when you're skydiving, when you're a skydiving cinematographer or photographer, you're using your limbs to fly. So, therefore, you can't really use uh, take a, tradi- a camera tr- in a traditional way and handhold it and look through the viewfinder and uh, change the settings and all of that. So, what we do is we put it on a helmet. And uh, with a helmet, you can point it in uh, in the direction you want and position yourself in, as, as you fly, you position yourself in the angle you want to have and, and the background you want to have and all of that. So the, the, the helmet actually changes configuration quite a bit. Um, I came up with the concept of the full face helmet many years ago, back in the uh, early 80s, uh, right around uh, 80 or maybe even 79. And this was at a time when I actually, it's, it's a funny story. It's kind of a long story that I can't really get into here because we don't have too much time. But um, it is uh, something that I came up with as a, as a fluke, as a mistake. Uh, originally, it was a, a looks thing that I was interested in. I was looking at, at looking cool, you know, and I thought the full face helmet would be a cool look. And then it was kind of a disaster. It wasn't working practically. So I started modifying it and modifying it, and then I broke it. And in trying to fix it, I discovered that uh, if, if I could design a helmet that was tight around the, ha- the head, and it didn't have a hinging point like straps and things like that, you could carry more weight safely. And that's when I started developing more and more the full face helmet, the shape of the the front chin and all these other things. And it's just been a a, a lifetime of changes and improvements and, and discovery. And, and it's just, a, 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 I'm passionate about, you know, discovering these things and inventing things. They're usually just for me. I don't invent things for something, somebody else. There are things that I need for myself to perform. But it's been quite a journey to to develop the helmet to where it is now, and I, I you know, I'm already uh, developing a different helmet, and it's uh, again you can change the configuration which cameras go on it. In this case, it's uh, it's got a red camera, and it has a still camera, and it also has a couple of GoPros, and this is a pretty standard uh, thing that we that I jump for commercials, feature films, and things like that. I used to jump a 35 millimeter movie camera, which was a lot more uh, cumbersome and <laughs> and more, <laughs> you know, taking the film up and everything. But I'm very passionate about my helmet. Also, um, I have quite a relationship with the helmet. I, I actually named her. Her name is Marcella. <laughs> and um, I have a, a very, very strong relationship with her. And the reason why I say that is because at one time, I remember there was a couple of things that happened. One was that I was walking by the helmet fully loaded and i hadn't used it for you know for a month or so we i hadn't been something we hadn't been filming for a while and i kind of got scared i kind of looked at it and went wow i jumped that like that is scary you know and i started kind of looking at it with a little bit of intimidation and then i thought you know i haven't really been with with the helmet for a while so maybe i should have a little talk and i started talking to her and then thinking of of or as a, as an entity, something that's alive that that uh, that we we do something together. And the second thing about that is that unlike a shirt that you put on and now it becomes you, it's like you just you just uh, it's kind of like a different color, a different uh, you know look. But the helmet is too heavy to just pretend that you put it on and it's you and you're comfortable with it. It seems to have its own life, its own um, you know physics that it has to be exposed to. So when you jump out of the airplane. 
like one time I found myself where the action in front of me was going at a certain speed. So I had to slow down to that speed, but the helmet wanted to go faster than that speed. So I literally was battling the helmet, trying to hold it up. And it was like quite the muscle uh, work on there and, and pain. And I, I was finding myself at the end of the jump when everybody was going away for safety, I was having to just roll over and sit for a couple of seconds just to get that pain out of my head, out of my neck, so I could then properly deploy and not get injured, you know, mm -hmm. be kind of, it's kind of like a, when your legs are gone from, you know, skating too much or <laughs> running too much and you need it, even if it's just a few seconds to get it back. So I found that, and that's when I started realizing that it's more of a dance that I do with the helmet mm -hmm. than it is a, you wear it and now you become the superhero or something. You know, <laughs> it's really more of a, of a uh, you know, a relationship. And if I have to turn in a, in a different direction, I need to negotiate that change of, of direction with the helmet, you know, with Marcella. So we, we basically, I think of, of her as uh, somebody that I love and somebody that I dance with and we have an understanding and she doesn't hurt me. And I've been able to make many, many, many jumps uh, with this relationship and be completely safe. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is because of the design and a lot of it is because respecting the physics of, of the helmet and respecting how she wants to go and where she wants to go based on physics mm. and really negotiating and dancing with her instead of forcing things and ignoring that. Uh, an example would be when you open your parachute and your parachute wants to stop you from going, you know, at 120 miles an hour towards the ground and the helmet just would like to just keep going because it has inertia. So you have to negotiate that deceleration and, and and you have to uh you know you have to do it in a way that's not going to hurt you, you mm. know, so how many times have you had to pull for your backup shoot i believe i have right now uh 21 mm. Mm. how is that feeling when you when you do that are you instantly scared in the moment or is it just you've done it that much now that you're focused about what needs to be done yeah you know it's uh, i think you're more scared before you've had a, a parachute uh, a, a reserve parachute ride because you're kind of wondering if you're going to do the right thing, you know. And then when it happens the first time, you realize that you've had it on your mind all along. And if you're doing the right thing, you have the emergency procedures uh, very current. You 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 really got to go through them every time you jump. What if, what if something happens and you kind of go through the procedures in your mind? So then when it happens, you just have to go go for it. An example, for instance, and this was something I learned that was fascinating, I thought. Um, is that once I had to open my reserve, I had to, um, I was going high speed and I was, uh, I didn't actually have a parachute out and I, my, it malfunctioned completely. So the pack wasn't even open, which have been most of my, my reserve parachute rides. And, um, and then I found myself wondering what my altitude was, but not having the time to look at my altimeter because the logic was, if what if you have a half a second that's going to make the difference between life and death and you take that time to look at the altimeter so now you just learned that you're too late and you now you may be injured or, or killed or you know whatever altitude it is you just got to get things done and there's no need to find out where you are and it also opens up the need for the awareness of knowing where you are without looking the altimeter, which mm. is something I learned in photography, by the way, mm -hmm. something where a long time ago, somebody taught me that the light meter was not to read the light. It was to read your decision on what the light was. Once you made the decision through intuition and looking and experience, then the meter was to measure you and mm. see how accurate you were. So many and, great metaphors of, yeah. of all this, you know, skydiving and photography for, for yeah. life. Are, are there any signals that if you even the the backup fails, where someone where it would where you would signal to other divers to be like, look, I'm not working and I need I need help, and there is a way of being able to salvage that? Um, no, you mean to others that are in the sky? Exactly. It's like, mm -hmm. look, my backup's not working. Yeah. Um, and then is there some method to be able to try and? It it it's, uh, it happens sometimes, but usually what happens is that. We go into this world, it's like a mis magical world. It's like Peter Pan. Mm -hmm. And really, I'm actually uh, working on a project right now, and I'm, I'm um, really analyzing what happens in that moment when you, you're stepping on the edge of the door and you leap into this world. And, 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 and when we skydive, I know we're falling, 
But we as skydivers do it because we have the sensation of flying. We can go upward and downward and down and, and we can travel 500 yards in, in no time uh, flying to, in that direction and stopping. And it's all because we're relative with other people that are going at the same speed. So if we go slower than them, it looks like we're going up. So just like when you're driving in, in the highway and you're going maybe 80 miles an hour and you're going next to somebody that you can see in their window and you can see their face and you, they're right next to you a few meters away. And it's, it's uh, they're not going at all. Mm. You know, they're not moving at all because you're moving with them. So it doesn't look like they're moving. Mm. So if they are ahead of you and you want to get ahead, you just go faster than them and you get you catch up. If you want to go slower, you slow down and go away. So it's the same thing we do in the sky. So what I'm trying to get at is that we're in such that world and focusing on that world until our time is up to wake up, come back to reality and realize that we're getting closer to the ground. And at that point is when you find out if you have a problem or not. Mm -hmm. So that's when you find out um, if, if you're going to need to do something about it. You, when you deploy your main, then you find out there's a problem or, wow, something went wrong and I didn't notice it or uh, whatever your type of malfunction you have. And that's when you got to get down to business. And at that point, you're by yourself and you're gotten away from everybody else precisely so you can deal with your parachute and, and not tangle with anybody else and all of that. So a lot of the end of a skydive is to separate and find clear air so you can mm -hmm. uh, be perfectly alone and not be <laughs> crashing with somebody else or something, mm. which, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the concerns. So I've seen your videos at the end where you hit the ground and it's just that moment of sheer elation. Like mm -hmm. I only did skydiving once and I had that moment of elation. I saw it on everyone else as well when I did it. But before that, you have to jump out of a perfectly good airplane. <laughs> do you still have fear when you're doing that? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do have fear. I have fear of, um, I have fear of performance. Uh, I want to do a good job. And what, also, are, what are we talking about there in terms of the mechanics of the dive or in terms of the photography? The mechanics of the dive and the, yeah. and the, and the, uh, the equipment and my decisions on, on photography. Uh, if you think about it, going back to the helmet, it's uh, because you don't have it in your hands, you don't have the luxury to making changes and stuff. So you have to almost predict what's going to happen. If the sun's going to be behind clouds, if it's not, if it's, especially when you're descending, you know, it's like the sun is going down faster than it normally is because you're descending. So you have a different perspective. You may all of a sudden find yourself uh, behind a, a cloud that gets between you and the sun. So you have to kind of, and a lot of this for me is intuitive. It's something that I have to make a guess. I have to try to read into the future, which I've gotten really good at. It's uh, something I learned through Diana, my first wife. And uh, you kind of want to read the future and, and make a prediction, and then you make that decision based on that. So then, at that point, you're committed, you know, and you're and you're and you're really hope that you've made the right decisions and the right choice. So that's that's a. Uh, very, very important there, you know. Mm. So. Your relationship with Diana has been such a, you know, important part of your life as well. How was that relationship in terms of what it taught you and how you grew as an individual? <laughs> um, well, first of all, I I really owe the best of me to her, to to my my little sky dancer Diana. Uh, I met her, and it was funny because I I met her through I was making doing my first jump, and everybody was talking about her and showing the newspaper where she was. Uh, you know, published and he was like, oh, here she is. She was doing parachute jumps, demonstration parachute jumps for the president of Mexico. She was a lieutenant in the Air Force in Mexico. And I was like, oh, she's, I'm sure she's just a bitch, you know. <laughs> so I totally judged her. And then the next weekend when I came back to make my second jump, um, I met her and I just, my jaw dropped. This is such a, a simple, beautiful, loving person, kind and, and, she was just so attractive, you know, and, and, and I don't mean physically, I just mean her, her energy. And so we, you know, we started, you know, to know, we get to know each other and we fell in love. And, um, so she, we started, you know, doing things together and in time we married and moved to the United States because this was in Mexico. I was raised in Mexico and, um, learned to skydive in Mexico. And then there was a point in our lives where she really demanded um, she kind of said she had had experiences before with energy and, uh, you know, exchange of energy and being aware of that energy and telepathy and things like that. And I was, uh, you know, not really in, into that. 
I didn't really believe in anything. And she really wanted that in her life. And she, it was something that was going to cost me my marriage, you know, if I didn't really engage. We were about 22 years old, maybe. And um, so I, when she made it very clear that it was important, I decided to engage and, and uh, seek help from a friend who was very, you know, connected and, and all of this. And uh, the first thing he did is handed me this little book called The Book of Life by Robert Collier. It's uh, written in 1925, a seven-volume little book. And it is about w things you can do when you're, with your mind, how powerful the mind is and all of that. And he taught me about telepathy. He taught me a few things. And then our lives were just so enhanced. So at that point, Diana started doing so many other things. And she started, she invented something called freestyle. At the time, back in the early 80s, uh, people were only skydiving on their belly. There was uh, um, no nothing else. Anything other than being on your belly was considered... Uh, being unstable. And she started wanting to dance in the air. And I remember I was challenged by a lot of it and I was actually pushing back on it a lot. I remember her telling me, well, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to try that and, you know, and all these things. And I'm going like, well, that's just the dumbest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, why? And I went, well, you know, I won't be able to do that with you because I won't be able to follow you to shoot it because I can, you know, you're going to be changing fall rate and all of a sudden descending really fast, much faster than I can because of her body positions, all this three-dimensional poses and stuff and just beautiful stuff. And then she was like, well, I guess I'll have to do it without anybody seeing it then. And I was like, I can't believe I said that. I cannot <laughs> believe those words came out of my mouth because it's not how I felt at all. In fact, I, I have moved from Mexico because I felt I was, we were pushed down and and to push somebody down because you couldn't keep up is just a, a, a crime. But obviously I caught myself and it was like, okay, now what I'm going to have to do is get better. And just like that, the intuitive side, as well as that side, it became things that I learned from her because now I had to become better at something so I could keep up with her. And I had to become more intuitive, which is what she wanted. So I could keep up with her, her creativity and her, her, um, you know, being so to the moment, like the pre-planning was never part of it. Like, for example, one time I remember jumping with her and it was always like this, uh, when we, when you skydive, you get, uh, you plan on the ground and you kind of, once you're outside the airplane, you go ready, set, go. And you kind of have the sync that you go with this count. And one time she goes ready and then she left and i was like what the <laughs> hell happened to set and go you know and uh and i said you just sucker punched me you know you just went and and then she said you know this ready set go stuff is for you i really don't need it i just want to go when i want to go and i was like oh here's another one of those lessons isn't it <laughs> free free spirit yeah yeah and so i went like you know if i really want to capture her I'm going to have to learn when she's going to go, even before she knows when she's going to go. So I had to learn to read her, use those things that she taught me, then she demanded I learned from the beginning of our relationship. Now this is fast forward years later, and, uh, and, and enhance those skills to be able to read a future even before she knew when she was going to go. So mm -hmm. when she could feel that she was going to go, I already knew that. Mm -hmm. And we could go together. And um, because if you're looking at something, and watching it and going, wow, that's great. I should go to it. By the time you react, you see it all come into your mind and your mind makes the decision and your your body reacts physically, you're way living in the past. Mm. But if you have the intuition to read that and live that future and meet it in a moment in the present time, you're now in sync. You're mm. now uh, in a very powerful state. Mm. And that is one of the things I learned from her. So, I mean, there's just so many, we could, we could do hours just talking about her. I actually want to do a documentary on her and the relationship we had with this. So she pushed me and my photography through those skills grew and I matured and all of that just thanks to being involved with her. And I, I grew as a human being and I grew as a photographer just tons, just from being exposed to that, from being challenged by that and from being exposed to her. So my little sky dancer, I love you. I always will. And she's so present in my mind. And I am so thankful for everything she taught me. Mm, I love that. Mm. Uh, as a photographer, it's like your mission to be able to get the, the perfect shot of the day. How do you balance being present and enjoying the experience versus trying to capture the perfect shot? <laughs> you know, that's an interesting question because a lot of times 
you kind of miss the experience um, or, or the experience of what you're, what's happening in front of you. But I've traded for a different experience that's more powerful. Um, for example, <clears throat> some of my work, like we were saying before, happens in a state of mind where you're, you really can't be thinking. You have to get out of your way. You have to be almost unconscious. Mm -hmm. The first time it happened to me, it scared me. I was developing these skills and these senses. And one time it's like, I was not there. I, if the jump ended and I was like, well, what just, what happened? Well, where was I? And then people are celebrating a world record. And I'm going like, I wasn't, I missed it. I missed it. I went to sleep. What happened? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, later on the people, the photographers that were, you know, conscious per se, uh, didn't get the picture. I was the only one that got a picture. And I was like, I don't know if I can even put my name on it. It's like, I wasn't there. How did it happen? And what it was, uh, I, I learned that I was going into a stage where in order to really see and, and live in this future that I was describing earlier, you had to really get out of your own way. You had to really stop thinking. You have to be willing to, to go there. So in a way, you may be missing something but you're trading it for a, a, a connection to a different world and where you're, where the, the skydive, the world record, or all these other things, or Diana's skydancer's performance, Diana's skydancer, of course, Diana, my wife, uh, um, that performance and all that, the, the looking at that is traded for uh, capturing it. Mm -hmm. And when you capture it in that state of mind, the material is that much more powerful and that much more special because you're such in such sync. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like you're missing one thing, but you're, you're cap you're capturing something else and you're living something else. Yeah. It's no different than you, know, if you look right, you miss what's on the left. And if you look <laughs> left, you miss what's on the right. Yeah. And you do that by choice. Yeah. And, uh, and you embrace that choice. And for me, I relived the moment based on the photography. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, it is super interesting to then see what I captured, mm -hmm. especially when it matches that future that I visualized, because I visualized the images. And also I went to a stage, which uh, we could get into if you want, uh, where I started going beyond and was actually not getting what I visualized, but um, it it is almost like getting capturing beyond what I could visualize. Mm -hmm. And I interpreted it as something that I was missing, that I was not capturing accurately what I wanted, where in reality it was, more beautiful than I imagined it. And, but I had to get out of my own way even to allow the concept that this was even more beautiful. That, that to me, my visualizations and my being in this in this state was simply a vehicle to see even beyond what I could see. Mm -hmm. So, what do, what do you think about social media these days where people are putting filters and all of these different things? Um, there's all <laughs> these face tune apps to make people look completely different and, you know, removing clouds. And obviously there's just basic editing that happens when you're in films yeah. and, and photography. But in, in terms of just a, a completely inauthentic... Yeah, you know, trail. that's interesting because the very first time I... I saw that and had an opinion about it. I almost didn't have an opinion because I, I was so biased and I, I had to just let go. It was when I first saw <laughs> scratches and, and dots and stuff like that, which is like, you know, like a, a, a plug-in that you can add s scratches so it looks like film scratches. And, I, and I'm going like, I worked a whole lifetime to, to get around the scratches and to make sure my film wasn't scratched and it didn't have dots and hairs and things. and. And now you you have a plug-in to put him back in. <laughs> it's like, what is wrong with this world? But uh, you know, I think that we're so busy trying to do something different and something that that we're missing the the point of the essence of it. You know, for me, um, the essence is in what message you want to uh, you want to provide. And if it's just more wow, that looks more wild. So you so it captures your attention. Now you're in the world of look at me, look at me, look at me. The social media side. But if it's a message you're trying to portray or a beauty and love that you're trying to portray and share, which is what I'm about, then uh, you try to use more of the artistic and creative look that makes people go, wow, how did he do that? Or "How? what is that? Mm -hmm. I've been in jumps where I captured images that um, the people in the jump asked me, what 
jump were you on? This did not look at all like what <laughs> the jump we were on because they're so focused on their job. They're focused on getting to the formation, the place where they're going to grip somebody else and dock in a specific place. It's very pre-planned and they're just, they're not looking at the surroundings. And for me, I'm looking at children in a playground and surrounded by clouds and beautiful manifestations of nature and how we fit in it. And, uh, and the best way for me to share that beauty, especially for a non-skydiver who doesn't necessarily is interested in skydiving, but could perhaps be interested in a powerful image of people doing their thing, of children in their playground, then I have to capture that essence. And, and that essence and that feeling and that uh, intuition and all of those things we were talking about, then live in the image and people look at it special that way without an effect, without distorting it, without, uh, you know, adding hairs and, <laughs> and all those other things. So it's not, it's, it's valid if that's the goal at hand and it is effective, but it's just not my world. It's, uh, yeah. uh you know, I, I'd, I'd rather, um, I'd rather be more of a purist in that sense, but that's just a personal choice. You know, you know something, I think you're being very kind on that one, Norman. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, yeah. I am being kind. I, I, I do hate it. <laughs> yeah, pe people are becoming clones with all uh, this. I see the same stuff now yeah, as well, yeah. and it's um, it's awkward. Uh, two, two big phases of your life that put you on the, the path you're on were when you were 14 years old and you had that jungle expedition for the first time which instilled your love of photography and, and filmmaking. And then at the age of 19, when you went skydiving for mm -hmm. the first time, how did those two events open your eyes on the world and your role in it? Well, you know, it's funny because I, I was just having this conversation a couple of days ago with somebody and it dawned on me um, that, in, that in my childhood, when I was very young, I want to say eight years old or something, um, I used to ask my mother for bus fare. And the, the game, and she would go like, where are you going? You know, and then we lived in Mexico City and I, it, me and a friend would do this and, and, uh, and, and go, where are you going? She said, well, we're just going to go get lost and then try to find our way home, you know? And she was like, what? And then she'd try to give me money for cab fare just in case we couldn't find our way back, you know? <laughs> and I go like, no, that defeats the whole purpose. So we would get in a bus and just pay and not pay attention to where it's going, not read where it's going or anything, and then get in different buses and hitchhike and whatever and and end up in this just crazy opposite part of town, not being familiar with it. And then our our goal was to get back home, to figure our way back home. And always through asking, you know, asking people and all the stuff and using your intuition. It was this way. I, I remember it that way. Or I remember, you know, just kind of trying to sense for it. And in the jungle, it was a similar situation. It was, it was a beautiful expedition. We were very young. It was just three of us, two four, uh, 14-year-olds. I was 14 and an 18-year-old. And we formed this organization uh, to, you know, bring something to the Indians and study them and bring some supplies for them and help them in whichever way. And it was just a pure, um, you know, interest in, in helping and in also intriguing. And that was it. So, you know, we went into the jungle. We're totally over our heads. Um we started all kinds of problems because they didn't want anybody from civilization. This is the, the border of Guatemala and Mexico and uh, the Mayan Indians, uh, Lacandon, which are the descendants of the Mayans. And there was like the nearest sign of civilization was 75 kilometers away. And, uh, and we found in, ourselves obviously. in there yeah. and one of the, the older kid got malaria. And so we were like, we have to get him out of here. We, he just had a big, we didn't know it was malaria at the time, but uh, we, uh, we had a fever and he was just hallucinating and all the stuff. And so we were like, we got to get him out of here. And, and the Indians were like, we, we, you know, they didn't speak Spanish, but one of them did, which was our host. And he was like, I can only take you so far. I'm not going to civilization. There's no way. And, um, so he kind of put us in our, in our journey and said, just go that way. But this is, there's no trail, you know, just, just, just a jungle and you got to work your way through it with a machete and dodging snakes and things and you know that want to bite you and hurt you and <laughs> sounds like life <laughs> exactly <laughs> like ah so it, pretty soon we found ourselves lost and uh we weren't prepared we didn't have food didn't have weapons they had just banned weapons in mexico so we went in there without weapons and scared super scared and uh you know after a long day or day and a half or two days uh um 
the younger kid, the the other young kid, I should say, uh, started hallucinating. He started hallucinating from lack of food and exhaustion. And now I was like, I I'm I'm alone now. You know, I got to take get both of these guys out of here. And uh, then I started hallucinating. You know, some time shortly after that, and so it got really really scary. So we, I just that even if we were going to be eaten at night, that I, we needed sleep, and uh, just started taking risks on what to eat, you know, plants and things, it, because a lot of the things we weren't eating because they had told us there was a lot of poisonous things, you know. And again, we knew nothing. So somehow we found our way out of there and found our way to a little farm or a little uh, tiny hut where a farmer was, and and he saw us and was like, "What are you guys doing here?" You know, and and. Um, and helped us out. And I remember thinking to, he, you know, so it was like quite the experience. And I remember all this in, intuitive powers. What That's when I first really started using them. But again, then I remembered my, my eight-year-old <laughs> experiences, you know, <laughs> getting lost from, on purpose. <laughs> and, uh, and then I remember clearly going, I have to come back and, and shoot this and share it with, with people. I, I was not a photographer. And I became a photographer. I got a $25 still camera with one lens used in a pawn shop um, and a movie camera, Super 8 movie camera, and uh, did a lot of more research, learned about photography a little bit, not through classes, just self-taught. And how did you want someone's life to be changed after watching what you would have shot there? Well, the the thing I wanted uh, at the time, that what I thought I, I would contribute with sharing what I saw was... Not only that there was a, a beautiful world that was pure, that was not uh, contaminated by by this, by society, by the comforts of modern society and all the aggressions and all the things that the city life, you know, Mexico City is quite a big city. So the contrast between that and living in a hut that's a dirt floor and, and it's, uh, you know, eight by eight feet and uh, sleeping in a hammock so you don't get bit by stuff and it was a different contrast and i loved the simplicity mm. of the thinking of the indians and there was just more connection with with the earth and what more connection with life uh just from that simplicity uh there was no rat race there was no you know nothing like that yeah. so i i promised the guy i would be back and uh, 2 years later I went back as a as a sixteen year old. Now these other two guys were not interested in going back. <laughs> <laughs> like you're on your own. <laughs> yeah, and I had met uh, a girl, you know, in uh, Marichu, and uh, she went with me. And um, I don't know what our parents were thinking. Now I was really mature. I was sixteen. <laughs> I was really mature. <laughs> so uh, we went back, and this was a reverse situation, which was we worked our way in there walking, and I I could feel the same sensation of being lost. But this time I, I had a, a, a level of confidence that was like, I can find my way anywhere. And it was just an intuitive thing. I don't know how else to describe it. We kept pushing through and pushing through and pushing through. In 75 kilometers of, of jungle, you could veer off just one degree and be off, you know, completely. But we kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And I was starting to wonder, but it was just like the self-confidence kicked in and and a couple of days later, you know, of, of being in the jungle, uh, pushing through a lot of miles of walking, um, I saw this Indian. And all of a sudden, you know, he's clearing this field with his machete. And he looked up at me, and it was my host from from two years ago. And that's how in the hell you find somebody in the middle of the jungle, and it's the first person you run into is him. Not somebody you go, hey, where are we? How do we find our way to this village? And you know, and then you find, hey, where's this guy? You know, <laughs> I, I was just in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, no, no, we we ran into him. Yeah. He was the first time, and he looked at me and went, "What in the hell?" It's just like we were so out of place, you know. Yeah. And I says, "I told you I'd come back, yeah. and I'm here to stay, uh, to to do this shooting and 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 share about you." And so we stayed for three months. Oh my god! In the jungle, and we learned language. We learned. We recorded the language. We we I did a documentary on it. Um, you know, this is my, I didn't know anything about film, so it's really crude and it's very, uh, you know, uh, non-professional, if you, you should say, <laughs> but it got me started in, in my career and it was all that the motivation, which is still what drives me today, is to capture the beauty that I see and share it with the world. Yeah. You know? And, and uh, so I, I completed that task I, uh, and I, I returned safely home and I, I was so alive. 
to have done that, to have just not let the fear stop me and not let uh, the apprehension and and th- this was a crazy thing to do, mm-hmm. but it was what drove me. It was it was like I just wasn't going to let anything stop me. And and uh, when I look back, I have no idea other than I was 16 and I felt invincible. And the same was when I was 14. And and I just powered through anything. And um, and now I have the material to show for it. And mm-hmm. and such a great experience. Now with the perspective mm-hmm. of the years that you have been able to live, the crazy experiences you've had. Why do most people feel that fear and not take the action? And what what can people do to make sure they take the action in spite of their fear? Well, I, I can tell you that because that's one of the things that is also alive. We talked about it a little while ago in skydiving. You asked me if I had fear, and I said, yeah, I have fear of performance. I have fear of what could happen to me. Maybe this is the last jump I'll ever do. Uh, maybe, you know, there's a lot of things. And then, you you know, people ask you, why why would you do it? You, know, you can even ask yourself, why would you do it? But there is an incredible amount of uh, reward on the other side of fear. It's uh, courage is not the no fear generation. It's not not having fear. It's having fear and pushing through it to not let it stop you, to find the things that are on the other side. All the rewards. One of the clear rewards I can see that you can find in the other side is self-confidence. Now, who doesn't want a piece of that? You know, when you when you uh, you take that fear and and just manage it, and and you learn to manage it, which is what we do in skydiving. You know, in skydiving, you learn that you, if you turn that fear into panic, now you're paralyzed. Now you're you're stopped. Now you can't go further, and now you're have a bad experience. But if you decide you're going to go through and nothing's going to uh, stop you from it and you're going to have this experience, now you look at the fear and, and you do it uh, more as a, a self-preservation kind of fear. You use it for preparation. You use it to, uh, you know, in, our, in my case, to make sure my reserve handle is in place, my cutaway handle is in place, my, all my, my harness is in place. Uh, you know, that that everything is in place so when I need it, it's there. And that I trust the people that packed my parachute or I trust that I know how to operate the camera and that I'm not going to get hurt and that Marcella and I are going to dance successfully and and uh, and all of these things. And, and, and then the fear is just there, but it's not uh, something. It, it, the lack of knowledge, is it, it converts the fear into into panic, we had, into cri- crippling panic. And on the other side of the non-crippling panic, which is the panic that just keeps you alert and the panic of what could possibly happen, there is an incredible amount of reward. And I think that's what people are missing. And that's the correlation between skydiving and, and real life is that I live this in every jump and I and I get to do it anyway. And I get to, to on the other side, go, wow, I'm so happy I did. If you notice because you've done it already on the other side of that fear, just before you exit it, there was this complete reward of happiness of, of not stopping because of the fear and also of doing something unique and, uh, and completely crazy that, uh, that you now have as an experience, mm-hmm. but the, the, the managing the fear and, and doing it anyway is a, is a, a, a wonderful source of uh, inspiration and love and, and, on and on and on. Yeah, I, I think people are so detached. For they, they feel the fear and they don't take action, and therefore it's been too long between drinks in terms of them yes. experiencing that reward. When I did the only time I did skydiving, there was a woman up there. I think it was her sixtieth birthday, and it was a gift. All her friends had passed the hat around and said, "We're going to send, we're going to send her up to go skydiving <laughs> to celebrate her sixtieth birthday." She was absolutely terrified. I was actually surprisingly calm. I think it was so high that you couldn't see the ground that yeah, I actually yes. wasn't, I didn't really feel much fear for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and this woman, right as the doors open, we're about to go, it's all tandem skydiving as well. So she was attached to someone. She is freaking out massively. And I'm looking at this going, how is this guy going to handle this situation? <laughs> And he rolls out of the plane with her, and I'm like, wow, this is going to end. And then um, when you're out there, the first thing I noticed skydiving is that you can't breathe. Well, I couldn't. I was like, whoa, it's, it's hard to, very hard to breathe. It's very loud. 
And in the moment they pulled the shoot, she was screaming in elation. She'd never been so happy. Yeah. They hit the ground, unlatch, gives the guy the biggest hug ever. And it's such an interesting thing that sometimes in life, we know there's a destination or a reward that we want. Sometimes we need someone else just to help us take that first step Absolutely. so we can experience that joy. Absolutely. And I think uh, talks like this maybe will help uh, people realize that the reward is really worth the risk, mm. uh, especially if we you turn the risk into something that's not just dumb risk, you know, mm. like unnecessary risk. It's not like you're going to go do something completely irresponsible. You're just, uh, you're taking the precautions necessary. Mm. You're going with experienced people and all of that. But I think the, the if you don't do it, if you wait too long, like you say, and then you're just too used to saying, no, 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 I think this time it doesn't feel right or all these things that stop you, all these inner chatter that convinces you that it's not a good idea. Um, the, I think the, the harm is, is greater than, than any kind of uh, harm Abs that can be on the other side. Absolutely, the harm of staying where yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you're not going to avoid that. Mm. I mean, you may avoid the harm of, of an injury or something like that. It's not like something couldn't happen. But, you know, like in the, in the words of Jimmy Buffett, I'd rather die while I'm living than live while I'm dead. Yeah. You know, in one of his songs, there's that the lyrics say that. And it's like, I mean, why would you want to hide from life so you can have more of it? Yeah. You know, why don't you spend it? And if you spend it and, and you're, you know, you're done early because you spent it all, you know, then you spent it. Yeah. But you could live an entire life and not live. I think it was yeah. Earl Nightingale who said most people tiptoe through life waiting to make it safely to death. Yeah, exactly. So interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it is interesting. Uh, Jeff Spencer came on this show um, and he mentioned, I forget the episode number, but I'll include it below. He spoke about the importance of being able to trust in your preparation and all the elements that you spoke about there. It sounds like you're just perfectly prepared. So that enables you to be present and confident for the jump. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think I actually listened to that uh, podcast and I remember that those comments. And um, the, think about it, like some of the preparation is the research and all of that and becoming experienced at what you're doing or trusting somebody else is and so on. But also some of the preparation he was talking about involves perhaps the mental preparation that an athlete goes through prior to performing, you know, imagining himself winning, imagining himself going through what he's going to do, even if it's something unsafe and just going through it safely, the visualization part. And so then imagine that no matter what happens, if you exercise that, you already won. Even, even you see what I mean? You already won. You won a state of mind in which you got to visualize those things and believe in yourself and, and, and really prepare and train in whichever way is necessary. And then the rest of it is just the outcome. But that journey, is, is nobody can take that away. Yeah. So even if it's for that reason, you know, the excuse is is the jump in this case, or the the competition, or or whatever record you want to break, or whatever it is. That's the vehicle, but the important part is what you what you gain in the process to that moment. You know, is that's really where the gold is. You know, absolutely, the, that's where the gold medal is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've achieved mastery in so many different domains. I was really curious about this. If you were going to train someone to be confident in doing a solo skydive as quickly as possible, what are the steps that you would take them through? I think you would take them through um, exercises on the on the fear part because uh, on managing the fear. Um, the self-confidence part, exercises on self-confidence and stuff, because the rest of it is not hard. So it's not something where you go like, this is so hard, only a few people can do it, which is the case in some things. Like, you know, some only some people can pick up a certain amount of weight with their bodies, you know, and they, even through training is like, and certain people can, you know, a certain age you slow down. And, certain, and skydiving is one of those things that is... Um, you can do even at later age and stuff because it doesn't require a lot of physical strength and things like that. What it requires is that you stop getting out of your own way and to allow the mind to to uh, connect with the body so you use your body for whatever it is the task is at hand, including the flying to achieve a, go a world record or something like we were talking earlier. So I think that's the part you would want to prepare people on. And so that way when they get to the part where the scary part, 
they are more, they have already gone through that journey of the self-confidence and stuff like that. Like an, an example is uh, one of the most amazing people I've ever met is Tom Cruise. You know, he he has a level of confidence and I'm sure he experiences fear, but he has a certain amount of, or an, an incredible amount of confidence where, and, and, and he wants to do his own stunts. He wants to fly the helicopters. He wants to do the jumping, the skydiving. He wants to do that. And although I wasn't present when he was training for the, the one of the films where he was uh, did, did some skydiving and I actually was only a consultant and a friend of mine did the shooting. Uh, the stories I hear and the times that I've uh, met Tom, the things I've noticed from him is he he learns at an incredible rate because he doesn't have time for that. He doesn't have time for, he just knows it's like, what do I have to learn? What do I have to, what, what information do I need to penetrate in my mind? And, and then he'll do it and do it and go, okay, I'll, I just got to do it better. I can do it better. I can do it better. And then pretty soon he's doing in, in a fraction of the time what other people take longer to do because they're tormenting themselves with, oh, I'm not doing it right or whatever. So uh, a lot of that is, 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 again, that's the part of it. And ironically enough, like we said before, when you take somebody and prepare them that way for something like that, you've actually given them already the biggest part. The rest of it is just uh, just so they don't walk away and go, oh, I got scared at the end, you know what I mean? But but really, the preparation is the journey itself, you know? So that is that's that is where you want to be powerful. That's where you want to... You want to connect. That's where you want to, um, you know, be invincible. That's where you want to, you know, like, like I say, going to the jungle and back alive, alive after I was lost is nothing compared to the state of mind I had to put myself in, even though that wasn't a training situation. That was just an intuitive survival situation. But I had to have a, a level of confidence. I truly thought I could never die. I couldn't die. It was like, what could possibly happen? I'm going to die. I'm not going to die. I'm obviously not going to die. Why did I think I obviously wasn't going to die? I have no idea. <laughs> but it was the mentality I had, and somehow it played a role. And that is something that I always want to be a, a, a pre present in my mind. You know, I want I want it to be just like I can't lose. I can mm. lose more if I don't do it. Mm. I can lose. I can lose life. You know, I, I, I want to be alive and, and being alive is, is, is doing those things, taking yeah. those chances. So, so I encourage people to really pick something that's, even if it's not uh, dangerous, pick something that's over your head, pick something that's, that's completely out, uh, over your, uh, your safety or your comfort zone and, and engage in it and, and, the, and look at the fear and learn to embrace the fear and not push away from it. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's welcome the fears. Thank you. You know, and I, I've been in situations, for instance, where I was in the verge of turning from the fear into panic, even with my experience where you're, you know, in a situation where you're under a parachute or something and you're going like, I should have not done that or whatever. And you're going like, here, I can totally make the wrong decision and, and hurt myself. And, and then you have to talk to yourself and you go like, Remember what you know. Remember what you know. Just do exactly all your training comes into place now and do not visit with fear in that area, like with the panic side of fear. Do not allow that in. Keep the fear of making the right choices, but do not let that one creep in. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not invited. And you keep that. I mean, you feel it coming in and you go like, ah, we're not ready for that part yet. Mm. And then... When you come out of it, you go, I was totally prepared for this. I was just scared because it could have gone wrong, but I was totally prepared for it. And, um, and that interaction, that moment when you saw that, the, the, the sabotage part that was creeping in and push it away and go, ah, I know you, I, you're not invited in this, in this moment. I'm not going to have a conversation with you. And you just push it away and power through and get to the other side. That was the golden part of it was noticing it watching it come in pushing it away staying with whatever and not allowing things to to get in your way it's so, so that is what you want to live for you want to you want to train for that so the the challenges that i speak of whether it's a uh, skydiving out of a, an airplane or whether it's uh, challenging yourself to do something that's out of your comfort zone it's just a vehicle to go visit this kind of thing because everybody that's uh, that's done something uh out of the ordinary has to experience that 
and they can all tell you the same thing that that it's the journey not the destination i know it's a cliche but uh yeah. but it is really true absolutely you know it's not fearing step 3 or 4 in the journey it's executing the step that's right in front of you it's exactly what i've got from like the the navy seals and people that yeah, i've interviewed as well absolutely. they notice that if they if they worry about something that's a few steps away they're not going to come home to their families absolutely and it's like yeah. the same thing as when we were talking about uh you know that uh, that i was mentioning not looking at the altimeter it's one of those things where you were asking me if there's time or you just focus on it you are just focused on it and if you focus on it and if you go like oh what could happen well, how high am i you know that's that's letting your mind distract mm-hmm. you from the task yeah. that's that's wondering what's going to happen do i have enough time do you have time for that thought is the question not yeah. do i have enough time <laughs> <laughs> you don't what? have time for that thought you have time for everything else and then if you if 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 it goes wrong and and you went trying, but don't waste the time thinking about whether you have time or not. What what's the most danger? You you mentioned that like sort of that danger bit there. What is that? Is that when you're pulling your shoot? Is that like where eighty percent of things that are go- going to go wrong will go wrong, or is there another part? Yeah, there's wrong? there's many different things. You know, some of them, um, like for instance, uh, I was I had a parachute jump where I was tangled. I was in a tandem jump. As a matter of fact, we were doing some shooting. I was facing the tandem master tandem master uh, because i wanted to shoot a handheld camera over her it was a girl friend of mine uh over her shoulder at, a, at another parachute uh, behind us and i could never get a front view without going flying with my parachute right at him and in a fast speed you know where you're going in opposite directions so this was an experiment like hey what if i go and handhold my camera and i go passenger and all this stuff and i ended up with a with part of the the small parachute that that you float from that slows you down, I ended up uh, with that wrapped around my ankle, you know? And uh, so we were spinning and spinning and spinning and all I could see is this green blur in the background. And, and so now I'm thinking, okay, I, I, I have to cut this thing. And I had a knife and she's looking at me like, Oh, my art, my knight in shiny armor with a big, you know, knife or something. And, and I was cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting. And it was like, I, 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 and she was helping me and I'm going like, you help me by looking down there and taking care of the altitude. And I, and I have no way. Yet. So I, I'll just take care of cutting us loose. And, um, and, and the idea was that if you don't cut that loose, then your reserve can tangle with that. So you always want to get rid of the problem before you go into your next parachute. Mm. And, um, and pretty soon we're going and going and going and intuitively I'm going, uh, we've been, we've been in free fall too long and, uh, I, ha- I have to do something, you know? So then my choice was to, um, to open the reserve regardless of, uh, you know, not taking a chance. And then, and I choked, I actually choked because I, I looked at the handles and then started thinking, it says I'm, I'm backwards, which means the handle on the right is now the handle on the left. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And in that moment, I was too late, and she pulled a reserve for us. In the in the moment where I was like, wait, wait, wait what am I pulling? And I wasn't aware of the uh, tandem system anyway, because I wasn't a tandem master. So I'm just merely a passenger with, uh, uh, you know, and, and I just kind of, and she was doing her part and s- saved us both. And I saw the whole, the deployment hit that part, but not get tangled and, and deploy. And it was, you know, so that's one of those situations where you, where you do that and, and, um, I had another one where I had a parachute wrapped around my helmet, my camera helmet, and I couldn't release the helmet. I couldn't release that, and I had to open my reserve into that mess. And I remember, um, I remember thinking, if I'm going to die, I'm going to shoot uh, what's happening behind me. And I looked behind to look at the mess and how the parachute kind of came hit next to it. It was a, r- a round parachute back then. Was that was the you know I was more dangerous. And I opened uh, at about 500 feet, which was about three seconds from impact. So, um, and but I made the right decisions in the right moment, and I had three seconds to spare. Imagine if I had, if I had thought, "Hey, do I have enough altitude to?" I wonder if I should look the other. You know, that could have been the three seconds. You know, are you just trying to get as horizontal as quickly as you can, so you, you're not going straight down? Yeah, you're, you're basically trying to stop the parachute to stop you, the parachute to deploy, and then yeah. you stop, and now you're going at the parachute fall rate. Yeah. And, uh, wow. so there, there's situations like that where you, you just got to make your choices, but, um, the training allows you to really make the right choices that way to, yeah. And when, when you get scared is once you land, you know, that's when you go like, wow, that was scary. And then you may be overwhelmed. You may need to sit down. You may, you know, but in the moment, even when there's pain, 
you know, you land, everything's okay. And then you, then you start hurting or then you go, ah, oh, you know, that, you know, that's doesn't feel right or whatever. But uh, again, there's, there's wonderful lessons in, in handling that fear and focusing on, on the task at hand. And again, when you focus on those things, you learn that, that energy of being so focused that not even danger distracts you, you know, mm-hmm. like you realize the priorities of focus, focus, focus. It doesn't matter what you just know. You got to keep going. You, you can't worry about whether you're going to get caught by somebody or something or whatever. Mm-hmm. If it's a, I don't know, a war situation or something, you almost have to, you know, keep going and know and trust your training. So mm-hmm. You've experienced pain um, very closely, obviously, personally, but also very closely with what happened with Diana. You've also captured pain in your role as a photographer and cinematographer. Uh, you've watched that pain transition to death. What is the lens through which you view pain today and its role in either breaking or defining people? Well, you know, there's a lot of things that are, that are encompassed in that. You know, like I even had the experience with Diana uh, it's almost like the 20 years, 22 years that we were together, all the training on this intuitive stuff that we were talking about earlier, all came to, uh, to a final moment when she invited me to, to, to stay connected to her as she passed to the other dimension. Um, and, uh, and there's no, I can't think of a more beautiful invitation that somebody can do when you, when you have a connection with them where you can feel them and feel their energy and see the transition between the physical to energy and see them depart your body and stay connected through that transition all the way to the other side and see what's there. Uh, there's, there's no, no, no better way to do it. And, uh, and no, no, not no more of a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, what's the word it's like um privilege and now that brings me to the question you had which is about um pain and that kind of stuff it's um and i go back to the same thing which is first of all i, I can tell you a quick story about that moment when she transitioned that puts it into perspective we are there she's taking her last breaths first of all i call the hospice people so their their instructions were don't call 911 anymore we had prepared to die and um, and I come back from the phone, and she's there gasping for air, and I see my camera. And I was like, no. And then I went, yeah, yes, this is who I am, and this is who we've been. I've been shooting her all of my life. She was my best model. You know, I was shooting what she created. I was, you know, and I said, she, she, she's not going to have a problem with this. And it was not a lack of respect or anything. And I shot a picture, a single picture, and then put the camera down and went went to her. And then in that moment, a car comes to a screeching halt. We were in a balcony or in a deck 18 feet up in, in the street right down there. And a, a car comes to a screeching halt with these young uh, kids coming out of it all excited and going, hey, hey, yelling up at us. And uh, we're, it was there and two friends of mine and uh, and my son. And, um, and I, you know, I'm going, what could possibly be so important or more important than this, you know? And they go, Hey, did you see our kite? We lost our kite. And I'm going like, really? But of course they don't know what we're going through. And in that moment, I could see that, you know, the pain, uh, of passing and losing somebody and all of that. It's all by design. We're all going. It's a matter of how we're going to spend life. It's not a question of how we're going to save it. So, so I learned to deal with it more as a that particular kind of pain as a as a normal thing. There's the pain of the person you miss. There's the pain of maybe you know whatever might have happened that might have been not not great, not peaceful. But it is no tragedy to die. It is by design. We are all going. And why are we hiding from it? You know, it's like, I don't mean rush into it head first, but, but why wouldn't you want to live, live every second of it? And, and, and even if it shortens your, your time span, you know, live it. And, um, you know, and then there's the, the pain of, of, uh, you know, injuries and things like that and whatever that that's a lot of where the fear comes, you know, nobody wants to get hurt. And once you get hurt, 
there's uh, the fear is even different. You know, I, I I've been injured and and there and there you come back and you have these flashbacks of that injury and you find yourself in similar situations and you kind of doubt second guess yourself you know, second guess yourself he's like oh no you know here we, and then you realize you're just you know you're reliving that but it all falls in the same category which is you can't let that stop you you can't say oh whoa that hurts oh i'm never doing that again it's like no i mean that hurts and you know i, I made a mistake or that hurts uh it was an accident uh, and then you 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 manage the fear just the same way. So it's no different than the fear conversation. Mm. It's just fear of pain or fear of a certain kind of pain. So it's the same conversation. Do you want to fear? How do you escape the fear of dying? You can't say by not dying. Mm. You really can't. Mm-hmm. You know. So you might as well escape it by living it and 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 smiling at it and embracing that fear. You know. Mm. It's like the Marcus Aurelius quote, death smiles at us all. All a man can do is smile back. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> right. I was going to ask if there was one image that means more to you than anything else you've ever captured. Is that the one that, that it would be, the one you took of Diana? You know, I, I think that could be one of the most, uh, because of that, it, it was a, it was a, her and I were so connected, especially after that invitation. And also I saw her um, brush away things that would have been insults to us or or offended, like, you know, somebody doing something and she getting offended, like, I, and she's, you know, you could see her going like, like that stuff doesn't bother me anymore. I'm, you know, I'm, tr- I'm turning into energy soon. Why would I want to worry what that somebody says about me or what somebody's motives are to come over and visit just because they want to say, oh, I got into the visit with Diana or something or whatever, you know, things like that. It's more like she wasn't worried about those things anymore. So I knew she wouldn't worry about this. And, and we ha- she loved the photographer in me, contrary to, you know, <laughs> my other relationship we were talking about, <laughs> the narcissist side of it. Yeah. And, uh, and so then this, this is not going to be an intrusion. And I also didn't want to miss that journey. This was not about capturing the journey. I just wanted to capture that moment and then put it away and, and rejoin in the, in the uh, invitation she presented to me, which was to to stay connected all the way through to the other side. And as she stick, stuck around for months, giving me power and energy and, and beyond what I had before with her when we were together. I mean, my, my skills and my, my, my power and my intuitive side and, and, my, and the things that I learned to do with energy were uh, multiplied by 10 once she left. It was like she... It put me in touch with that other side where, where all the source is where I can tap into it. And she kept reminding me and she kept visiting me and, and, uh, it was wonderful. You know, it was, it was amazing. So why wouldn't you, you know, why would you want to, yeah, there's pain. Unfortunately that there must be a purpose for all that. You know, the pain is, there's, there's physical pain, this purpose, there's a purpose for it too. And, and there's emotional pain and all, all the stuff. And, um, but never, uh, should be, something to shy to keep you from shying away from living you know Mm. the power of perspective on that wow that's so that's so powerful thank you for sharing that a final question for the rocket round on your best day what's an affirmation that you would write on a flashcard to show yourself on your worst day i would say the uh, that would be the the perspective that there is between failing and winning in other words Usually on your worst day, you feel like you're failed. You feel like uh, things didn't go your way or you failed at something or whatever. And I learned that through some of the capturing of things that I thought I failed because I was I had such an intuitive vision of what I wanted to capture and I didn't capture it, that I considered it to be failure. So only to find out later when I gave it a chance and I looked at it, that the beauty that was there was beyond what I had imagined. So I was tagging the most beautiful work I had done as failure, which was only a perspective because you can't, you couldn't say that's a failure. You just was looking from that point of view. You were looking from that. So I, I would have to remind myself that failure is only a perspective and it's, and that you can step into success by simply changing the perspective and looking at exactly the same thing and considering 
uh, a success. Mm -hmm. It can be uh, that your failure turned into a success just by the fact that you learned something. But uh, that's what I would remind myself because I spent too much time in failure dragging myself down. And, and when I realized that my best work was found there, I, I, I vowed to not go back there. And it's hard not to go back there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's now move to the win the day rocket round. Ten questions for some quick answers. Number one, what quote inspires you the most? Mind, the mind is like a parachute. It works best when it's open. <laughs> so good. Number two, morning coffee or evening wine? Evening wine. Coffee wakes me up. <laughs> <laughs> Number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18-year-old self? I would say uh, be willing. Mm. Number four, what book do you gift the most or what contributed most to the mindset you have today? Uh, think and grow rich. Mm. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Number five, was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? Absolutely. I once was somebody that didn't believe in anything. I didn't believe in there, that there was any energy surrounding us. I was raised that way. There was no God. There was no um, power or anything like that. And then I, uh, that became my superpower, which is what it is now. I, I learned it through Diana as we already spoke, and it, it, that, that is it. Right there. Number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? I already said it. <laughs> that failure is only a perspective. Absolutely. You gave a really great answer for that one before. Uh, number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? Steven Spielberg. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, Any I, specific I really, questions uh, you'd want to ask? I have a, I feel like I'm, we're very similar on the styles that we have and how, and, and I'd love to just sit around his energy and, and yeah. Mm. Number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or your business? Would it be this bad boy in front of us, Marcella? <laughs> this is Marcella is one of them. But uh, I, there's also other tools, um, you know, like uh, I, I, I have a, uh, an app that I use for meditating. It's called uh, Waking Up. And uh, um, I, I really find it a great resource. I also am a part of a course that is uh, um, Living Your Purpose by Kathy Goulet and uh, a great bunch of people that are part of it. And, um, you know, and I also have a personal therapist who uh, specializes in narcissism, the relationship, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, her name is Susan Spicer. And those are the, the tools or resources that I use um, basically to, to, to keep me in, in, in the zone. Mm, yeah. yeah. So get good. me out of the dark. Yeah, because I spent some time in the dark. Yeah, and re as we all have, and recognizing that there's other people to lean on to be able to to get you through it. So I think that's really important. Uh, number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. You have just spent your entire life just destroying bucket lists. So what's <laughs> what's left apart from meeting <laughs> Steven Spielberg? <laughs> you know what? Uh, you know what's funny is that I I have a, more like a, a you know two ton barrel of <laughs> a list <laughs> more than a bucket list. I still have many things I want to do. Some of them include, uh, I want to do a documentary of my adventures in my life. And um, the documentary is not so much, it's not about me, uh, or, you know, it is, but uh, about me and Diana and the skydiving, but it's not about that. It's about the experiences that I learned and the, the ways I got out of it, the ways I grew, the things that I was negative about and had to turn into positive and all of those things, because I think people would find inspiration in those things. So that's why... Uh, I want to do that. And I also have, um, so it would be a, a, a series of documentaries. And I also have a book that I want to, a uh, second book that I want to complete and uh, a documentary on Diana, <laughs> other documentaries <laughs> and, and on and on and on. And I, you know, I'd, I'd love, I just, I really need uh, to partner with somebody that can see opportunity in this as far as, you know, making this into a series and turning it into reality because I'm kind of a, a solo act on the stream in the bucket list. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. And final question, what's one thing you do to win the day? You know, I've already talked about that too. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's look, uh, looking at um, courage. It's uh, realizing that, that uh, the fear, you know, what lives behind fear is wonderful. There's love and there's lessons, there's growth, there's self-confidence and all the things that we look for and that we want are behind the fear. So reminding myself of the courage to not let fear stop me on everything, because that's not just limited to skydiving. It's, it's on everything else. Mm -hmm. And if I may, if I may just add one thing, that's not just because I know we're out of time and I just don't want to make sure I don't forget one of the biggest highlights of my life uh, that I also have Diana to thank is my son, Ramsey. 
and his family. And, uh, and um, I had an opportunity to work with him in several films and, um, you know, films like uh, Godzilla and films like uh, Kingsman, the secret service. He's in front of the camera on that. And uh, he, you know, him and he's, he's now has two children. So he's made me a grandfather and, uh, and him, him and his wife and, and the whole family is just a great gift. And I'm really thankful for that. So I just wanted to make sure I threw that in and that lives in the, in the bucket list completed Ta- uh, you know, <laughs> dreams kind of thing. They're know. lucky to have the coolest granddad getting around. <laughs> <laughs> they think I'm nuts for sure. <laughs> well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Norman, and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can visit his website, normankent.com, follow him on Instagram at Norman Kent Productions, and check out his cinematography at skydivingmovieproductions.com. Again, all that and more will be linked in the show notes. Norman, great to see you, my friend. Thanks so much for coming on the Thank show. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure sitting with you and exploring all this uh, stuff. Thanks for joining me on another episode of the Win The Day podcast. We want to hear your thoughts on what we covered today, so drop a comment on the YouTube version of this episode with your favorite takeaway, any questions you have, or what actions you'll be taking as a result of what was shared in this episode. And if you found value in the Win The Day podcast, leave a five-star rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You'll find a link to both of those in the show notes. It'll only take you a few seconds and more ratings really helps other people discover the show so they can get the mindset upgrade they need and we can bring more winners into the Win The Day movement. That's all for this episode. Get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I love this shit. Never get tired of this. Never get tired of it.